James and I are going to talk to you today about the latest legal developments in our sector. James is going to have a chat to you about IFRS 16 and I'm going to talk about two particular developments in invoice financing. Over the last year to 18 months we've been receiving quite a few inquiries from our clients on IFRS 16 and the impact that that may have on their business. IFRS 16 is a new accounting practice that will come in on the 1st of January 2019 and the effect of that accounting practice is to change the way that operating leases are treated. Currently accounting standards distinguish between finance leases and operating leases. Any operating lease which is for a period of greater than 12 months will now have to be included on the balance sheet of any company. Why is that important? Well, for companies that um, have loans, the calculation of their debt is very important because it has an impact on a number of different provisions of those loan agreements, primarily the financial covenants. And so if there's an increase in the, in the calculation of the debt of that company, this will have an impact on the calculation of the financial covenants. An increase in debt is a detrimental impact on the financial covenant calculation because those will have been set to only allow that company to incur a certain amount of debt. Now, due to these new financial standards that were coming in January 19, through no actual change in the operation of that business, there could be an increase in those debt levels due to this change in the accounting practice. So it's very important that companies that use a lot of operating leases find out now whether or not this change will have an impact on their business. So the first thing I want to talk about is assignment restrictions. And this is a particular concern in the SME space because quite frequently the payment obligations in those types of contracts for supplying goods and services for those entities are subject to assignment bans. And there's no real intention to stop those entities gaining funding. It's just there and it does cause issues. There are ways around it. Obviously we can have consents, waivers, you can set up trust arrangements, but they all have cost implications for the clients and also um, t a time delay on getting funding. So there's been a lot of international and domestic focus on this. There was some recent legislation that was passed and under that legislation there's been some regulations which is currently sat with Parliament due to become into force soon. And effectively the, those regulations are going to nullify any ban on assignment. They will apply to any business to business contract regardless of size. They don't apply to um, tenancy agreements and also um, any contracts for land and um, in relation to financial services they don't apply to those contracts but otherwise they apply to any business to business contracts. They are not retrospective so effectively when the regs come into force any contracts after that date is when the, the, the ban on legal assignment will apply. Obviously the intention behind this is that businesses can just obtain funding and any bans on assignment in their contracts will be void at post the date of the regulations but that's going to take time for people to get comfortable to be able to rely on those regulations. So hopefully what it will mean is, fingers crossed, that the um, funders will be able to fund SMEs quickly and on a more cost-effective basis. So the second thing I want to talk to you about is the case of Lumi versus Cobra, which has been making its way through the courts. Briefly, the facts are um, there was a receivables finance agreement, an RFA, which was entered into between the two entities. And then a year later, Cobra um, went into administration. Lumi then um, served a notice to say it was going to collect out unless the receivables could be repurchased, which they couldn't. So Lumi then commenced the collecting out process and then subsequently served, uh, fairly shortly after, served a notice to say that we're going to charge 15% collect out fee. And they were entitled to do that under the RFA because it said there was a discretion for them to charge up to 15%. And then the case came about as to, to whether that collection fee could be charged and also whether it was for the right amount. There was two main points that the court decided. First one, that the collect-out fee was not a penalty, so therefore any collect-out fees did not need to be based on the actual costs of the funder collecting out, which is quite an important thing. So it's likely in the future that collect-out fees will be enforceable by the courts. But it's also a key point of the, of the case was that um, any funder had to act when, when exercising discretions in relation here to collect out fees, that they had to act in a way that was not arbitrary, n not capricious and not irrational. And it was actually found that 15% didn't fall within that criteria and actually the amount they should charge would, should have been lower. 
The case highlights, one, that collect up fees are likely to be enforceable, but two, that discretions, and maybe not discretions just in relation to collect out fees, but obviously in RFAs there are lots of different discretions that a funder has to exercise, that those discretions have to be exercised in accordance with that duty, um, and that from a funder's perspective they probably have to record how they've made those decisions to demonstrate that they have acted in, in, in that way. And from a borrower's point of view, I suppose it gives them comfort that discretions in RFAs, which are common, um, will be exercised again in, in the same way. We're a national law firm, so we're able to service clients from all over the UK, and we're really excited to have recently opened a banking and finance practice in Manchester, a new team headed up there by Jonathan Edwards. And if anybody has any questions about any of the items that we've raised, please do get in touch. Thank you.